Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. In Rio Arriba County in New Mexico, it was on an access road to a public campground. In May, while camping in the Santa Fe National Forest in northern New Mexico, I experienced a most peculiar visitation. I was 30 years old at the time and a trade school student in Albuquerque for machine drafting. I was part of a student group from the Southwest Indian Polytechnic University in Albuquerque. We were camping fairly high up in the mountains and hills on an alcohol-free student activity prior to the end of the school year. Our student advisor was a Mr. Ray Peatimo from the Pueblo of Acoma, New Mexico. Early that morning, at around 4 a.m., I was asleep in my own tent alone when I was actually awakened by an awful stench. This foul odor was so powerful, the scent actually burnt my nostrils. I sat up in my sleeping bag just in time to see a massive, light brown, hairy arm reach into the tent through the front flap and start to feel around. Totally horrified, I started to hyperventilate as this huge arm clearly was not human. Just as I was about to scream my lungs out, the arm drew back and out of the tent. I was strangely aware that there were two creatures right outside of my tent as I heard two separate and distinct vocalizations, one male and one female. Through the dim outside light and through the tent material, I could make out at least two figures, possibly eight feet in height. The next thing I heard were these two beings yelling loudly as they apparently ran away from my tent. I stayed awake until sunrise and was so enthralled by what had happened that I could not bring myself to tell anyone about this event. And at breakfast, no one else there was talking about any similar occurrence. I have never told anyone about this until earlier this year. I have never returned to that area. It was around 4 a.m., one dim light outside. Close to where I was, overcast, visibly poor, the area is hilly, mountainous area in northern New Mexico, forested and fairly isolated. On to the next one. Truck drivers passing along a lonely stretch of road north of Trey Pedras in Taos County in New Mexico reported seeing a huge hairy creature with red eyes. It was not a bear and was reported as monkey-like. Locals said it had been in the area for years. On to the next one. In Otero County in New Mexico. Me and a distant cousin of mine had something strange happen to us near Mescalero. It was very early in the morning, maybe just after sunrise. We had to be at work at the Inn of Mountain Gods, the casino golf resort on the Malascaro Reservation. No one wanted to give us a ride to work, so we decided to walk the main highway and hitchhike to work. This happened in an area where my father lived. From my father's house to the paved road is a distance of maybe about half a mile. We finally got to the paved road and maybe walked another quarter of a mile when we started hearing noises from across the road at the tree line. Prior to this, I can't remember when. I had heard something similar when I had gone outside to hang clothes. It was just before sunset and I heard something scream. It scared the living daylights out of me and I ran inside. I had been home alone and couldn't wait for my father to come home so I could tell him. When I did finally tell him, he told me it was probably an elk bugling, which I didn't believe for one minute because this thing was very high-pitched. Anyway, I was telling my cousin about this incident, that it kind of sounded like 
That time I heard something before. All I know is that it really scared us. I have walked that road before, even at night by myself, and I have never been scared like that. We also noticed that whatever it was, it sounded like it was following us along the tree line, because when we stopped, it stopped. And at one point, we started running. It seemed to run along with us. That's when we really got scared, because we could hear the branches snapping. We didn't know what to do, because we were too scared. And there weren't really any houses nearby to run to. So we were half walking and running, trying to decide if we should go back to my dad's or just keep going when a truck came from behind. We waved those people down and jumped in. I don't think we even waited for them to ask us if we wanted a ride. I don't know what that thing could have been. All I know is that it was making some really scary noises and it seemed to be following us. Maybe a couple of weeks before this, I'd heard a weird scream coming from the distance while I was outside hanging clothes. This scared me so bad that I just went inside and didn't bother. The reason I was so scared when me and my cousin were walking was because this sounded very similar. This happened in the early morning, I think maybe between 6 and 7 a.m. It is all forest in this area, except for the paved road that goes between two ridges. You hear stories now and then about Bigfoot in the area. My dad has heard stories. I know when my children go visit him, he rarely ever lets them play outside. He says it's because of bears. On to the next one. In Otero County in New Mexico, a situation that my friend Edgar and I experienced one night when we were camping in Cloudcroft, New Mexico. In the summer months, Edgar and I had pitched a tent. At about one in the morning, we were awakened by a scream that was coming from far away. The sound kept getting closer and closer. We kept trying to figure out what animal was making those noises. We were too scared to look out, so we just stayed very quiet inside the tent. We could tell that the animal was looking for food because it was making stops at each of the camping spots. It sounded awful. It was like a screaming baby or a screaming woman. In between each scream, you could also hear some grunts. Eventually, it reached our camping spot. We could hear that it was looking around and it left. It continued the screaming until it faded in the distance. The following morning, we asked the camp manager if he had heard anything during the night. He said no. When we told him what we heard, he dismissed it as a cougar. Since we are not experienced campers, we believed him and left it as that until I heard Bigfoot recordings online. They sound almost identical to some I found. What we heard was within a few feet, but they sounded the same as recordings online. There were two witnesses, Edgar and myself. We were both sleeping inside our tent. It was about 1 a.m. It was a clear night. No lights were in the area. There was a fire pit with some embers still burning. On to the next one. It was late September when Marcy and I had decided to take one of our usual hikes on the Appalachian Trail from Bull's Bridge to Ten Mile Hill. This was a regular hike for both her and me, and I also regularly take my dog, Murphy, in there for an extended walk. This day was different, however. Generally speaking, there are quite a few people who engage in hiking the same trail, which means that on most occasions you will have company along the way as you hike. But, as I said, this day was to be different in more ways than one. We had three days of solid rainfall, including some torrential downpours, and on the morning of our hike, it was still raining. We had decided in the spur of the moment that we would put on our rain gear and take in the sights and sounds of the raging Housatonic River. With the excess of rainfall for several days, the river's level had risen to exponential proportions and its rapids were raging. We were well into the hike and along the trail 
There are many locations where the river is in full view, as well as being able to hear the raging waters flow throughout. It was about two miles into the hike when we both heard what sounded like a loud, prolonged howl that was emanating through the woods. It was loud and deep, and the rainfall was picking up dramatically at the same time as we were hearing it. Now picking up from Mercia's point of view, what Linda just told you was exactly what happened. The two of us looked at each other simultaneously saying, what was that? It was about a mile or so later into the hike that we were walking through an area of tall pines, except for the tops of the trees, all the pines are barren of boughs. Below these trees, as the trail meanders through the forest, the floor is covered in greenery, with many small bushes and trees here and there cropping up all over the place. This, in conjunction with the many thousands of closely packed pines, made it extremely difficult to see with clarity for any distance. As Linda told you, when we heard the howl occur, we couldn't tell from what direction it was coming. It was simply reverberating through the forest as if it were everywhere at the same time. I know this sounds a bit strange, but we both experienced the same thing, so to us, it rings true. Now, back to Linda. At any rate, the howl at this point had occurred some 20 minutes earlier, and we were approaching an area in the woods where visibility going forward severely limited to say the least. The rain was coming down so hard at this point that it was as if we were walking in an amphitheater filled with loud white noise. The two of us were walking with our hoods on and our heads down, so no rain could get into our jackets. I was walking just ahead of Marcia as we were approaching this area of low visibility. Speaking for myself, I was somewhat peering through the edge of my overhanging hood as the rain was pouring off of it when suddenly this huge Bigfoot comes bounding across the trail from our left-hand side. I know that it didn't see or hear us because we didn't see or hear it. It had taken one long stride to step across the trail and then it stopped abruptly, obviously having seen us out of its peripheral vision and turned to face us. The creature's hair was soaked and lying flat against its body. For a moment, it made a facial expression as if it was saying, oop, but that simple look quickly changed. Moments later, its expression turned to a snarl of disdain and it showed us its teeth while clenching its fists. Marcia screamed and fell to the ground while trying to move away. The beast took a fast lunge with one quick step directly at us. I swear to you that I thought I would die on the spot from sheer terror. Then, as quickly as it had all happened, the creature turned away from us and walked away into the woods. I helped Marcia to her feet, and as the two of us were both crying and trembling, we scurried out of the area. This monster was so tall and broad that words are insufficient to describe it. It had to have been eight feet tall and half as much wider, with its body being composed of muscle upon muscle. It was like looking at a racing thoroughbred in the paddock, lean and muscular. Its feet appeared to be a couple of feet long, and its hands were the size of a large skillet. We didn't know if its appearance had anything to do with the fact that no one was there that day, or what, and this howl which we heard had to have come from it. But for what reason? Was it calling another creature or was it coming in response to another that had made the howl? We will never know. But what we do know is this. Bigfoot is as real as real can be. And they are roaming the mountains and foothills of New York State for sure. On to the next one. Although this story was written by Dad, it was told to him by our grandfather, Walter. This event took place on the Whiskey River Creek near the Rogue River in June of 1941. I am, with pen in hand for the record, due to highly unusual experiences with an animal that rumor has reported and that I have seen, 
I give you my story. I packed a large skid pack for a long trip. I was going to see a friend down the rogue at Whiskey Creek. I started hiking at Gray Creek Junction with the Rogue River. The trail is pretty good this year. Snow is mostly gone from the pocket. There were signs of somebody walking the trail probably days ago. I'm carrying my H&R 410 shotgun in case I get a grouse or duck. I have plenty of hardtack and tatters. I made it to the Sanderson's place, but won't stop as the boys are down on the river and my knees don't feel like fighting the hill. I'll catch them on the way back. It was kind of hard going by China Gulch. Some pilgrim tried building a footbridge, but it's not working very well. I took the time to put a line in the water when I found an easy deer trail down to the river and caught a small salmon. It should make a tasty dinner. I made it to Whiskey Creek in the late afternoon and found my friend Cy working at the creek. He was working on his flume, which brought water down under pressure from a pyre on Whiskey Creek. He appears to be making money, but like all these miners, he's short on talking about finding gold which I can understand, so I never ask any questions about his work. I've known old Cy for long enough to earn his trust, and he invited me to stay for a couple of days, which is why I came. I gave Cy two loaves of bread that I had brought from the bakery for him. Fresh bread seems to be a real treat for the miners along the river. That night for dinner, Cy grilled the salmon I had caught earlier, and it was mighty tasty. Cy has done a lot since I was here last. His cabin is bigger, and he's built some new sheds. He said he's had somebody or something poking around, and he's had to put latches on the doors and nail the windows down. Cy keeps his venison, fish, and other game in a sort of root cellar, and he said something's busting that door latch, but he heard it, and whatever it was, ran like crazy when he fired a shot. He at first thought it was old man Jensen, but he hasn't been around lately, and it's been pretty quiet along the river. He said the Sanderson boys have also had somebody or an animal breaking into their building. The next morning, I told Cy I'd look around while he was working his claim. So I went down the back hill behind the cabin and behind the root cellar. I found some strange tracks along the creek below the cabin, and one set of prints looked at first like a bear, but the prints were a lot bigger. There was one really plain footprint that I couldn't quite cover with my straw fishing hat, so that's like two of my foot thighs. Must be a big animal. Don't know if I really want to run up on it, especially if it's a bear. The tracks were all over the place in the creek bed almost like the animal had spent a long time moving around below the cabin. I made sure the shotgun was loaded and I had left my pack in the cabin, so I thought I'd work my way around the hill where Cy was working on a water throw at the river. I figured I'd work my way up the hill and cross to where Cy had cut two trees and had two cross braces on them, with planks running along the poles, making it a pretty nice bridge. It was slippery, but I made it across safely. I walked carefully on the damp woods, and I doubt a deer could have been any quieter, and since I wasn't in a hurry, I enjoyed seeing how quietly I could make my way. The pine needles and wet leaves made my passage as silent as a snake. I wound my way around, so I was quite a bit above where Cy was working, and I crouched there and looked over the area. This was above where I had seen the large prints. Just then, something changed in my view, and at first, I didn't know what it was, but it was like the landscape changed. Without moving anything but my eyes, I kept staring straight ahead, and suddenly, it hit me. The large brown bush between two pine trees, 30 feet in front of me, was looking directly at me. It had eyes. I could only figure that it had been looking downriver as I was, and suddenly it must have smelled me or sensed my presence and turned to face me. We just stayed where we were, staring at each other for what seemed like several minutes, and then it was gone. Now, this was not thick forest, 
But by the time I reacted enough to make a move at the 30 or so feet to where it had been, there it was about a 100 feet ahead, moving rapidly downhill and into the patch of trees and bushes that lined the Whiskey Creek as it made its way toward the Rogue River. I moved to my left to force the creature toward the place Cy was working, figuring it would turn back when it spotted him, but when I rounded the edge of the heavy brush, it was gone again. I yelled to Cy to head it off, but he raised up from the sluice and looked at me and hollered, What? But he couldn't hear me over the creek's noisy rush. When I got down there, I told him what's happened, and we found a couple of tracks where it must have passed within a few feet of Cy. The tracks it left looked like the ones near the cabin, and now we knew it wasn't humans snooping around. So I helped Cy change the locking systems for the cabin and shed. I spent another day and a half visiting, and we even walked up the hill on the logging road that led up the mountains, but never again spotted the ape-looking beast. Cy didn't seem bothered by it, and he said many of the old-timers had talked about this animal, so this just added to the many stories among the mining community of the ape men of Rogue River. On the way home, I stayed overnight with the Sanderson brothers, and when I brought up the experience, they described the animal perfectly. They said it never did any damage, but on occasion, they would lose fish from their fish trap, and sometimes some vegetables would disappear, but it was never a cause to worry. They just tolerated it like the area deer. After this experience, I talked with a lot of miners and loggers in my travels, and the only trouble I've ever heard about was a couple of miners from upriver that supposedly were torn to pieces by a couple of big apes, but that happened over 20 years ago. The following sighting was brought to my attention by Raul and Edna, a couple from Cincinnati, Ohio, who had come to South Dakota to visit Edna's parents. Timing is everything in life, and for them, it was time to see a Bigfoot. Here is what they had to say. Raul, we had come for a family visit to my wife's home state of South Dakota. We had taken the week off, and during our stay, Edna wanted to take some time to hike the Little Spearfish Trail, which was one of her favorite haunts. Edna, I took Raoul down to Rufflock Falls Road, which leads to Timon Campground, where we parked to begin the hike. The day couldn't have been better, with blue skies, sunshine, and warm weather as we were hiking. We had made our way into a spot where we were walking through green grass with a sloping hill leading up to the base of a bluff on our right-hand side. This bluff was made from sheer, layered, multicolored rock strata. The base section was somewhat reddish, followed by a layer which was tan, and it was topped with a grayish, jagged-looking rock, which led your eyes up to a small shelf at the top edge that was backed by dark green pine. The two of us were hiking while approaching this bluff, and were commenting on how beautiful it looked in contrast to the surrounding area. It was then that a dark colored figure appeared on this top shelf, having apparently stepped out from the trees in as much as it hadn't been there only seconds earlier. Raoul, I had said to Edna, check out the man up there on the ledge, and as she did, I began to wave and shout, hello, when I shouted, the man immediately turned and stepped back out of view into the trees, and that was that. This entire area, including the bluff upon which the man stood, was bathed in bright sunshine. In other words, he was not standing in the shadows of anything. He was definitely completely dark in color, including his face and head, which led us to wonder what type of gear he could have been wearing and what he was doing up there. It was also more than a little odd to us that he didn't wave back and had quickly stepped out of sight, saying nothing in response to my greeting him. The trail we were on is part of the Black Hills National Forest, which, like any other large tract wilderness, has more than likely had its share of fires. I mention this because, as we continued onward, we were entering a somewhat large green 
open area within the forest, which was virtually covered in green, tall grass, in which were hundreds upon hundreds of what appeared to be either dead or burned pine trees, some of which still showed a little green growth on them. This area comprised a huge amount of space and was bordered by dense forest, which had apparently been untouched by the fires that had raged through here. Edna, I was craning my neck in one direction as we walked when I noticed some movement in the distance, so the two of us had stopped to look more intensely. This distance was more than likely over 500 yards, and I realized I was looking at one of these dead trees rocking back and forth. The day was completely calm, and the tree was moving back and forth very much in the same fashion as a fence post would if a man was trying to break it free from the earth. There were so many trees between us, and this tree which was moving, that we began to move, hoping to see what was at its base moving it. Finally, we got into a position where we could now make out a dark figure which was grasping the tree and shoving it back and forth in a violent manner. Raoul was first to say that it looked just like the man on the bluff whom we saw earlier being clad in the same dark color from head to toe. This rocking had already been going on for about a minute when we could see that the tree had broken free and dropped to the ground. We watched as this man, who, by the way, who we now believed could not be a man, walked along the side of this felled tree, picked it up, laid it on his shoulder, and walked away with it into the forest. I said that we now believed it was a man, based entirely on the violent way it was able to move this tree and consequently pick it up. The trees around us, of which there were hundreds, were between, say, eight and ten inches in diameter. They varied in height from between twenty-five and fifty-five feet, with some being snapped off at the top, the smallest of which had to have weighed in the hundreds of pounds, to say the least. This creature, we now thought was a Bigfoot, was flailing this tree back and forth like it was a two-by-four wall stud, and when it picked the down tree up, it had done so like you or I would pick up our backpack from the ground. It was like nothing to this beast, simply putting it on its shoulder and walking away with it. Neither of the sightings were at close range. In fact, the second was much further away than that of the bluff sighting, but there was no doubt that this creature was covered in fur entirely from top to bottom. Based on its height, when next to the tree it was rocking, there was no way of telling how tall it was, because we didn't know how big the tree was, and at 500 yards it was impossible to gauge anything of the sort. We walked out of there that day, changed people in every sense of the word. Raoul, having never given so much as a nod to the existence of Bigfoot, while I had heard of it but never believed it truly existed myself, obviously that perspective has changed for the both of us. To me, it's frightening to know that they truly exist and are wandering the same wood that we are on any given day. Based on its reaction to Raoul's calling, it seemed that it really doesn't want anything to do with us, but I could be entirely wrong about that as well. On to the next one. My mom and I went to visit my sister in Snohomish, Washington. We stayed for two weeks during the summer. One day, my sister mentioned we were going to Mount Rainier for the day. She wanted to show us ice caves and a carving someone made in the woods called the Maiden in the Woods. Anyway, my mom, two nephews, brother-in-law, sister and I got in the car and headed out before the mountain range was a valley that we drove down into. The valley was full of farms. As we drove, I began noticing these big wooden cutout silhouettes of what looked like, to me, was a Bigfoot. They looked like those silly black bear cutouts people put on their front lawns. Anyway, these were like seven or eight feet tall. I asked my brother-in-law about them, and he said, Oh, the farmers put them out there to ward off Sasquatch. 
Being from Michigan, I had heard about Bigfoot, but these farmers took it seriously. Almost every farm had one. It kind of freaked me out. Anyway, we drove on and started getting back into the mountains. After a while, we pulled off at an overlook parking area. This was where the maiden in the woods wood carving was supposed to be. We all got out and started hiking up this hill into the forest. Evidently, this maiden was carved out of a huge redwood pine. We hiked all the way to it, only to find it had been vandalized and partially burned. Disappointed, we all started back down the trail toward the car. It was maybe 2 p.m. and a sunny day. As we were walking down the path, my brother-in-law and I ended up towards the back. My nephews, five and seven, and my mom and sister were in front my brother mentioned to me to stop walking. And I did. And he stopped there listening. I was like, what? And he mumbled, keep walking and listen to the woods. My mom, sis, and nephews were oblivious to anything that was going on. So we started walking again. This time I was listening carefully in the woods and I heard off to my right something heavy, crunching an occasional stick and what sounded like something stepping down into heavy forest bed, but it was slow-paced. My brother-in-law motioned for me to stop walking again, and when we stopped, it stopped. This time, my sister and mom noticed we were stopping, and my mom said, What are you guys doing? Come on, let's get going. And we said, We think we're being stalked. And my mom said, Oh yeah? By what? One of those Sasquatch things we saw down by the farms? And we said, yeah, listen, start walking. So we started walking, and after a couple of steps, we heard the heavy steps in the woods again. This time, my mom turned around and looked at us, and her face was white. My nephews didn't look happy either. Just then, my brother-in-law said, let's get walking, people. Just after he said that, we heard the most hair-raising howl off to our right. It made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. It was a weird sound, too. It was sort of like a wolf howl, only it had a secondary register note to it, almost like it was bi-octave, like two tones coming out at once. All I know is we didn't stick around. We all ran as fast as we could to the car, jumped in, and tore out of there. Hearing other recordings of Bigfoot sounds, sort of remind me of the sound we heard. It still scares me. The witnesses were my brother-in-law, my sister, two nephews, and my mom. We were all walking down to the van. It was midday, a sunny day with sunlight streaming through the forest canopy. The area was a pine forest at the foothills of a mountain range. It was fairly dense. On to the next one. While stationed at Fort Lewis, 15th Engineer Battalion A Company, I received mountain training at the Huckleberry Creek facility. The final exercise was called the Alpine Scramble, a point A to point B land navigation problem with problems to solve along the way. While on the exercise, my squad stopped at a stream to rest and eat. There was a sand gravel bar going out into the stream we noticed large imprints on the bar and subsequently found several large footprints in the soft soil by the stream. They were not very long compared to some reports. Fourteen inches, but very wide, about seven and a half inches. They were also pressed quite deeply into the soil, while we had to really stomp to make any kind of real imprint. There was about a four to four and a half foot stride between the footprints, we had a tape measure. As we were on a tight schedule, we did not spend a whole lot of time examining the print, perhaps 10 minutes. Our squad leader was convinced they were a joke put on by our instructors. As we made our way down the stream, we saw an occasional print or mark for a short ways. Then they stopped. Whether they went into the forest or into the stream, I don't know. I'm not a tracker, nor could I tell you how fresh the prints were. An interesting footnote, when we returned to our base camp and were doing after-action debriefing, 
I spoke to our squad's instructor about this. Our squad leader objected strongly, but a few of the other members were interested. He strongly advised us to forget about it and not mention anything, so we did. However, it did raise my interest in the matter, and I have been reading and researching Bigfoot since then. The other squad members may have talked about it. I didn't and went ETS not long after. I did not feel watched or smell anything or any of the other reactions commonly described. There were six witnesses, including myself. It was mid-afternoon, between two and four probably. It was overcast. I believe it rained later. The area was typical Pacific Northwest woods, lots of trees, sparser near the stream. There was a ridge between us, and we came down it to reach the stream and followed the stream back to our base camp. On to the next one. I grew up in Skamania County, Washington. That's in the lower central part of the state. I spent my youth hiking and exploring the woods with my father. I had heard of Bigfoot sightings growing up, and remember a story in the Skamania County Pioneer newspaper about a deputy sheriff seeing one and them getting a cast of its foot. Anyway, I didn't believe at all in them because I had covered a lot of dense forest land and never saw anything or heard anything. My father told me he found a footprint when he was in his 20s hunting. It was in a patch of snow. He said it was kind of old, but he said it wasn't anything like he'd ever seen. It was about 18 inches long, maybe 7 to 8 inches wide, with toes and a deep impression. I still didn't believe in them. Like most people, some of the crazy stories about UFO and Bigfoot in them, and some of the characters that tell the stories make it easy to make fun of. So I've never told the story to anyone except one old timer who was a trapper who'd seen them several times. So here's my story. It was hunting season in the fall. I was around 21 years old and hunting an area of eastern Skamania County called Nestor Peak area. It has an old fire lookout on top of the highest peak, which is no longer in use. It's pretty rugged country, even though it's not all that far away from some small town. I had scouted the area several weeks prior to hunting season and saw a lot of sign and tree rubs and about three days before opening morning, I saw a beautiful four-point buck checking its rub. So, opening morning, I got in there about an hour before light and waited about half an hour after light and heard a loud snap and some loud rustling in the brush, but never saw anything. The area I was setting at was at the top of a ravine or a small draw with a road and a mountain behind me and the other side of the ravine side hill in front of me with a deep rugged canyon beyond that. After a while, I decided to hike over the other side and see if there was any fresh sign. As I got toward the top of the other side, I heard a lot of noise and something going over the hill toward the canyon. I approached slow, but never saw anything, but there was this god-awful smell in the air. It's hard to explain, but it smelled like a wet, old, musty dog that had rolled in some cow manure, but really strong and stinky. It was not pleasant, to say the least. I thought maybe it was a bear, because I've smelled bear before, but it was just different. The next morning, I went to the same place and waited. I heard noise down the ravine a ways. A few minutes later, I saw something walking up the other side of the hill. I thought it was a bear, but looked through my scope and was looking at a gorilla-type animal. It didn't really look like a gorilla, but that's all I could think of. It didn't seem real big. It was probably 80 to 100 yards away. Its head was wide and tall. Its arms were big, and they didn't go past its knees about like a man. It had thick hair on back, top of its head, and legs thinner on the chest and face. I moved kneeled down behind a stump and picked up my binoculars. It heard me, and the noise it made was unreal, like a cougar scream, but just different, and it dropped to the ground like it was hiding. 
I heard more noise, and from the right came another one, which was a lot bigger. It leaned down by the other one, stood up, and looked right at me. It was much bigger, probably three feet taller than the other one. It had a lot of hair on its shoulder, hanging down, and it was thick. Its face was not that covered, and through the binoculars, I could see its eyes, which were big, dark, and kind of human-like, and a human-type nose with large nostrils. It had a mouth that was straight across, and I saw its teeth when it opened its mouth. They were big and flat, not pointed. I could hear it breathing from where I was at. It was loud and deep. It was lighter, and if I had to say what color, I'd say it had to be dark brown in places and reddish in places. It had huge, hairy legs. I couldn't see its feet much. The little ones stood up and they walked slowly up the hill, stopping every 50 feet and looking at me. I'd say the big one was maybe seven or eight feet tall, not any taller than eight, and maybe 400 to 500 pounds, not like the stories I'd heard of 13 feet tall and a 1,000 pounds. They got to the top of the hill and another one came up from the right. It was a little shorter than the big one and kind of hard to see. It was probably there in view. I just didn't see it earlier as I was looking at the others. They walked out of sight over the hill into the canyon. I just sat there and was questioning myself what I had just saw. I was scared, but just totally amazed. I left the area and went home. I wished I had a camera so bad, but I'll always have the vision in my head. I went back there about three days later and walked over there where that little one kneeled down. There was some hair on a bush about six inches long, not much, and there was a few footprints around. I have a size 11 shoe, and I put my foot in the biggest one I could find, and it was probably three inches wider and five inches longer than my boot, so maybe 17 inches long and seven inches wide. There were some huge three-foot rock rolled over, and you could see they dug under them, or something had, and a couple of old rotten logs moved and broke up. But really not a lot of track, even though I know there were three animals there and no sign where they went over the bank into the canyon. Anyway, that's it, and I doubt I'll ever tell it again. I just wanted to let you know that there are real, sane people that have seen them. They just don't talk. On to the next one. Mike Mab, who's retired, was fishing late one afternoon at Kinderhook Creek when he looked up and saw something observing him from the other side of the creek. It was about eight feet tall with long hair on its head and short reddish-brown hair on its body. The eyes were small and round and the fingernails were black. They stared at each other for a few minutes, and it seemed as curious about him as he was about it. Then it walked into the woods. On to the next one. During apple season in autumn, there were a number of reports of a white Bigfoot in and near some of the apple orchards around Kinderhook. One Bigfoot had been seen running very fast through an orchard. On to the next one. Two hunters near Austerlitz, a hamlet about eight miles from Kinderhook, were out hunting in the Berkshire Hills when they saw an eight-foot-tall creature that scared them so much that one of them dropped his gun and ran until his friend caught up with him and tried to get him to go back for his gun. He refused point blank. The friend had to go and get the gun, and the hunter who retrieved the gun emphasized that it was no bear. In another sighting near Austerlitz, a hunter was startled by an eight-foot-tall red-haired Bigfoot. On to the next one. Two police officers saw a hairy, two-legged creature cross the road near a Washington County Highway Department garage. On to the next one. 
in Kinderhook, in Columbia County, New York. My daughter and I were making a right-hand turn at the cow pasture of Route 203 and State Farm Road when we saw a large, seven-foot-at-least, hairy, man-like creature. He was getting up from what appeared to be a crouch position to a standing position. I stopped the car suddenly. It glanced our way and then took off in the opposite direction through the cow pasture. The entire incident took less than five minutes. The creature's hair color was light brown. The hair covered his face except for his eyes and mouth and was clearly a male Bigfoot. It was between 5.30 and 6 p.m. on a warm, sunny day. It was a cow pasture. Currently, the area is a site of condominiums. On to the next one. Richard Newman and his son, Eric Newman, heard something large crashing through the woods near them when they were fishing and saw two large hairy legs pass them by. William Bud Mantle found odd footprints in the snow near the Whitehall Dump in East Bay. There were very long strides between tracks. A man saw a huge, hairy, ape-like creature in a field near Whitehall. Several residents around Whitehall saw a Bigfoot that was seven to eight feet tall. On to the next one. Margaret Mayer was driving on Route 203 near Winding Brook Golf Course near Kinderhook when she saw a strange creature standing on the left side of the road. She noticed the eyes first and thought that it was a deer as they were almost at ground level. Then it stood up and was then four to five feet taller than when she first saw it. It was not a person with the eyes being small but far apart. The Bigfoot looked straight at Margaret a couple of times. The creature only moved the top part of its shoulder and the head. She did not notice any arms and she could not see the top of the legs, which were really skinny. It looked deformed, yet it moved fast and did not seem to walk across the road, but moved across like it was almost gliding. The eyes were yellow, and the head went straight into the shoulders as there was no neck. On to the next one. Martha Helen Beck saw round, white eyes that were seven and a half feet off the ground near her back porch at night. She described them as bright white. A woman found large footprints in snow near her 4th Avenue home in Whitehall. The tracks were bipedal and appeared to originate near the tree line and circled her house. Susan Helen Beck a teacher at Ichabod Crane Middle School was walking in the woods near Cushing Hill when she heard strange vocalizations that sounded like the sound of a gorilla from the movie Gorillas in the Mist. On to the next one. In Washington County in New York, the witness encountered huge footprints at 6.30 a.m. in January in the woods about 20 inches long and found some tree branches broken down, walking back to the house. They felt like they were being watched. The next morning, one of the witnesses woke up to see a huge 10-foot-tall creature standing about 20 feet from the house. The creature wandered about for a while. It was brown in color and looked very human except for its size and forehead and its hairy appearance. After about five minutes, it walked past the house and up a nearby bank. As it passed the house, it banged on the wall, awakening the other witnesses. On to the next one. In Calvert County in California, my father and I went deer hunting in the area of Railroad Flats. We arrived late one afternoon and set up camp. Then we decided to go separate ways 
and scout the area around camp for sign of deer. I climbed a small rise and came to an open area with a wide path running along the top of the hill. I proceeded to follow the path for a short ways, but I had an uncomfortable feeling. I didn't see any deer tracks, so I returned to where we had camped. The next morning, I discovered it had rained lightly during the night, leaving the ground muddy. I climbed the rise to the path where I had been the day before. When I came to the path, I immediately saw large footprints. They were very deep in the mud and about 14 or 15 inches in length. They were shaped like a human's bare foot. They were heading down the path that I had followed the day before. Some of the footprints were on top of the ones that I had left the day before. I proceeded to follow them down the path. When the path sloped downwards, the prints slid, leaving elongated prints. The path continued on along the ridge atop, but the track suddenly took a left turn, heading off the trail and down the side into the trees and underbrush. Needless to say, I didn't follow them. I was in a remote area, and I don't believe anyone was near where we were camped to have faked the footprints. On to the next one. In San Diego County, I only know we were up in some small mountains or large hills, whatever you want to call them. We were somewhere in Camp Pendleton not sure of where. They took us out in trucks and then we walked to the location. The nearest town was Oceanside, California. While in infantry training at Camp Pendleton in California, we had dug in on a very large hill and were expecting an enemy force to attack in the night. I had one Marine with me and to our left were two others about 30 yards away. They were also dug in. We had a steep rock covered area right in front of us. We heard something coming up the side of the mountain. We could hear rocks rolling down the mountain. It came up over the edge and the Marine with me yelled, Halt! It stood up right in front of us, about six feet away. I could see the outline of this creature and it was huge. It looked about three and a half feet wide. It had long arms and a pointed head. It was very tall. From the hole we were in, I had to look almost straight up at it. I couldn't believe how big it was. It was so tall, big, and wide. I could see the outline very well, but could not make out its features. It made no noise, and there was no smell we could detect. It stood there for about one minute and then walked between us and the other Marines. I was terrified at that time, and my hair was standing up. I tried not to breathe. I had no idea what to expect from it. After it had passed and was out of sight, the four of us made sure we had all seen the same thing. Everyone said they were not going to say a thing. I have never before reported this, but now I know they exist. We also moved out before dark, so we could not check for tracks, but I knew there had to be some. It was some time after midnight. The sky was clear and starry, so I could see its outline very well. We were in some small mountains that were covered with rocks and lots of trees. My father worked for the Green Lake County Sheriff's Department back in the 70s. During deer hunting, some hunters had seen a Bigfoot near Manchester in Wisconsin. The sheriff's department sent people out with snowmobiles to try and track it. They never found it, but had numerous pictures of the tracks in the snow. My dad showed me the pictures they had up on a bulletin board in their meeting room. On to the next one. In San Bernardino County in California, a hairy humanoid was seen by a neighborhood boy. The following night, Jerry Lowellchell was with two children she was babysitting. A girlfriend had asked her to go out to where a hairy humanoid had been seen by a neighborhood boy the night before. Jerry went there with her friend and saw it approach her. It was big, hairy, and smelly. 
In fact, it smelled terrible. The Bigfoot's hand reached inside the car as she startled it and brushed against their face and scratched it. On to the next one. In Stanislaus County in California, a small hairy humanoid was seen that was five feet tall, disproportionately broad and square at the fore shoulder and with arms of great length. The legs were short and the body was long. The head was small compared to the rest of the creature and it seemed to have no neck. The entire creature was covered with dark brown and cinnamon-colored hair with a shock of hair on its head that grew down close to the eyes. On to the next one. On the road between Paradise and Butte County and Sterling City, Mr. and Mrs. Robert Bume saw a Bigfoot with short black hair flecked with white that limped across the road in front of them. On to the next one. At Wildwood Inn in Trinity County in California near Mount Shasta, at about 8.30 p.m., Bob Kelly and his family heard a lot of noise outside and discovered a six-foot-tall, dark brown, hairy humanoid fighting with some of the local dogs. The creature was throwing the dogs four to five feet into the air, and one of the dogs was covered in saliva, though there were no bite marks on it. When the people arrived, the creature ran away up a steep embankment. Bob had shot at a peeping Tom Bigfoot year before in January. On to the next one. At Oroville in Butte County in California, Mr. Charlie Jackson, his six-year-old son, Kevin, and his dogs ran for cover. They had been watching a bonfire they had built when they saw a female hairy humanoid standing on an old building 15 feet away. She had black skin on her chest, and her face was almost bare, though the rest of her was covered with filthy gray hair. She was seven to eight feet tall, had no neck, and also had giant flat breasts which hung down to her navel. She had a puzzled look on her face. Her arms were longer than a human's arms, and she swung her arms when she walked. The hairy humanoid was three to four feet wide at the shoulder and had a yellowish chest area. The feet were 14 to 15 inches long and very flat and very wide. The three normally very fierce dogs were cowering under the furniture inside the house. On to the next one. An organism whose existence has not been proven or disproven by science altogether. These creatures, collectively referred to as cryptids, include the Loch Ness Monster, Bigfoot, and the Himalayan Yeti, but they are far from the only ones documented. Indeed, nearly every country and region of the planet has its mythical monster or mysterious creature, ranging from the giant bats in Java to enormous water hounds in Ireland. Ahuls. Ahuls are giant predatory bats that are claimed to live in the East Indonesian rainforests of Java. With a wingspan of over 10 feet, roughly the size of a condor, Ahuls are said to be covered in a dense brown or black fur, similar to fruit bats, but with long, powerful legs and claws and the ability to pounce on and snatch up live prey, including humans, if legends are to be believed from open ground. While sightings of ahuls are frequently disregarded as mistaken sightings of owls, eagles, and other great birds of prey that share the same rainforest, some sources assert that the creatures actually exist and may even be isolated as yet undiscovered species descended from pterosaurs. Ako Rokamui, Japan's indigenous Ainu people, have long believed that Volcano Bay off the southern coast of Hokkaido is home to a huge octopus 
known as a koro kamui. Many sightings of the creature have been reported over the years. British missionary John Batchelor, who worked on Hokkaido in the early 1900s, described one such sighting in his book, The Ainu and Their Folklore, describing how a great sea monster with large, staring eyes attacked three local fishermen and their boat. The monster was shaped round and emitted a dark, fluid, and noxious odor. The three men ran in dismay. They claim not out of fear, but because of the awful scent. Whichever it was, they were so terrified that the following morning, all three refused to rise and eat. They lay in their beds, pallid and shaking. The Alta Mahaha is a 20 to 30 foot long river monster with enormous flippers and a seal-like snout that's supposed to inhabit the Altamaha River mouth near Darien, Georgia. Although several reports of sightings of the Altamaha have been reported over the years that Darien was founded as New Inverness in 1736 by a band of Scottish Highlanders suggests that the mythology is most likely a descendant of the Loch Ness Monsters, monster legends of the Scott settlers. The Dobar Chu, or water hound, is a mythical otter-like creature that lives in isolated freshwater locks and rivers around Ireland, usually characterized as a half-dog, half-fish hybrid with a long, snaking body cloaked in thick fur. The Dobar Chu is enormous and heavy set, yet can move quickly in and out of water, even keeping up with the galloping horse, according to one myth. Sightings of the monster extend back several centuries in Ireland, and there are at least two gravestones, one of which dates back to 1722 in County Lethram of persons who were allegedly attacked and killed by a Dobar Chu. Many indigenous Central African tribes believe that the Congo Basin's marshes are home to a huge semi-aquatic beast called the Amila Natuka, similar to but larger than a hippopotamus and armed with a single long bony tusk or horn in the center of its forehead. The Amila Natuka appears to be herbivorous, but like the hippo, has a reputation for being dangerously aggressive when disturbed and has been known to turn on and kill creatures even larger than itself. Its name translates as elephant killer. The waters off the coast of Cyprus's Cape Greco National Park are rumored to be home to a sea monster dubbed Tu Philicoteris, or the friendly monster. The monster's name implies that it has never attacked humans, but it has developed a reputation for damaging fishermen's nets and upturning smaller boats. The stories of the Philicoteris are almost certainly inspired by Greek legends of Scylla, a monstrous sea monster that assaulted Odysseus's boat in the Odyssey. However, sightings of the creature are almost certainly mistaken for squid or octopus sightings. The Groot Slang, or Big Snake, is a legendary creature supposed to live in Richardsville, a mountainous desert region in northwest South Africa. In in indigenous folklore, Groot Slangs were primeval animals that consisted of an elephant's head and front and a huge serpent's back and tail. When the earth was formed, the Groot Slang were seemingly destroyed, but legend shows that some survived and took refuge in the northern Cape province's deepest caves. Tales of gigantic tusked snakes, likely inspired by real-life sightings of enormous pythons in the same area, have rumbled on in South African folklore ever since. The mysterious vanishing of a British diamond magnate in the Richardville Cave in 1917 is occasionally attributed to Groot Slang. The Jersey Devil is a cryptid that is supposed to inhabit New Jersey's Pine Barren region. 
According to tradition, the creature was the 13th unwanted son of the state original immigrant, Mother Lieb. He offered her son to the devil shortly after his birth in 1735 due to her husband's inability to raise another child. Hundreds of sightings of a grotesque two-legged hooved monster with a sheep-like head and large scaly wings have been reported in the Pine Barrens since then, including one famous incident in the winter of 1909 when a long trail of hooved footprints mysteriously appeared in the snow one night crossing under fences and over walls and rooftops. The Manpingori is a giant ape-like creature supposed to live in the rainforest spanning the Brazilian and Bolivian borders. The Manpingori is around eight feet tall, has a robust and seemingly bulletproof gale cover on its back, dense red fur on its head and belly, long curved claws, and, if all the legends are true, a second mouth in the center of its stomach. When humans approach the Manpinguary, it's claimed to rear up on its hind legs like a bear and emit a foul-smelling odor to ward off potential hunters. A sighting was claimed in the New York Times as recently as 2007. The Ogopogo is a colossal water serpent supposed to live in British Columbia's Lake Okanagan. Sightings of the Ogopogo trace back to the early 1800s, when the monster was first given the, the indigenous name Nahaitaka, which translates as water demon. Ogopogo was not coined until the 1920s, when it was derived from the title of a popular English music hall song entitled The Ogopogo, The Funny Foxtrot, I'm hunting for the Ogopogo, the amusing little Ogopogo. His mother is an earwig, his father is a whale, and I'm going to sprinkle some salt on his tail. The Mongolian name Olgoi Kahorkoi translates as big intestine worm. Although this four-foot-long underground cryptid resembles a giant earthworm more than a parasitic tapeworm, Additionally known as the Mongolian deathworm, the Olgoi Kohorkoi appears to live beneath the sands in the southern Gobi Desert, emerging only during the warmer summer months or when the ground becomes too damp for survival. Sightings of the worm stretch back several centuries among indigenous Mongolians who claim the Mongolian deathworm can spit venom or even acid from its mouth and its body is supposedly coated in such a way, toxic slime, that anyone who meets it will die quickly. Momo, short for the Missouri Monster, is a cryptid ape-man akin to Bigfoot that is claimed to haunt the forest along the Mississippi River as it flows through Missouri. Momo was first recorded in 1971 and is described as standing between 7 and 8 feet tall, with a big pumpkin-shaped head and completely covered in thick, dark fur from head to foot. According to some stories, the creature is extremely hostile. Like the South American Menpingori, it can emit an odiferous odor, even worse than that of a skunk, to ward off would-be attackers. The British Isles mythology is replete with tales of mysterious black dogs that allegedly haunt rural towns and village. The Shuck, a monstrous black hound claimed to live in East Anglia on the far eastern coast of England, is arguably the most renowned, having allegedly assaulted a church in the Suffolk settlement of Bungray during a thunderstorm in 1577. While the villagers sought refuge in the church from the storm, a large black dog came through the door, killing a farmer and his son, and tearing down one pillar supporting the church steeple, which toppled onto the nave. The shuck supposedly left burn traces in the wood of the church door as it fled, which can still be seen today. Tazel worms are large, lizard-like creatures believed to inhabit the Alps' most remote region. Although their height and appearance vary, 
They are commonly described as being between two and five feet tall with a large cat-like head and a big gaping mouth. Their forelimbs are short and armed with strong claws, but they lack hind legs, favoring a long snake-like tail. Many sightings of the creature, dubbed tazel worms in Germany, arasas in France, stolen worms in Switzerland, bergsdusens in Austria, and basilicos in Italy, have been recorded throughout the Alps, most recently in 2009 in Italy's Il Gorino newspaper. Tahoe's Tessie is a lake monster rumored to inhabit the waters of central California's Lake Tahoe. Tessie sightings stretch back to the 19th century and typically describe a massive snake-like monster with a long neck and humped back that swims fast enough to keep up with sailboats. Surprisingly, Tessie sightings are always more frequent in even-numbered years than in odd-numbered years. Yowies are a type of ape like Bigfoot that are rumored to inhabit Australia's outback. Generally depicted as tall and stocky, with thick black or dark red fur covering them from head to toe, most claims of Yowie sightings suggest the animal are timid and easily startled. However, some tales claim they can be belligerent and emit a blood-curdling scream when confronted. Nowadays, the creatures are widely believed to be mythical. Still, in the 19th century, sightings were so common that in 1892, an Australian amateur adventurer and scholar named Herbert McCooey, who claimed to have spotted a yowie near Batemans Bay in New South Wales several years earlier, wrote to the Australian Museum in Sydney, offering to capture one for 40 pounds, approximately $3,000 U.S., or 1,800 pounds in today's money. He fell short. The lore of the sea is loaded with monsters, ghosts, and mysterious events. No event is more mysterious and spookier, even to experienced seamen, than abandoned ship incidents. One of the most enduring of these mysteries of the sea comes to us from the shipyard of Joshua Dewis in the diminutive community of Spencer's Island, specialized in the building of two masted brigantine sailing vessels. On the 10th of June, 1861, the shipyard registered a new ship, a 99.3-foot brigantine called the Amazon. The vessel's maiden voyage was a disaster. The captain, Robert McChellan, grew ill a few hours out of port, and the Amazon turned back to Spencer's Island. McChellan died of pneumonia before a doctor could be summoned from a nearby town. After this initial episode, the Amazon journeyed back and forth across the Atlantic, uneventfully under the captaincy of John Parker. Parker was fond enough of the vessel to have it memorialized in a painting which now hangs in a museum in Nova Scotia. This good fortune came to an abrupt halt when the ship ran aground a few miles from Glace Bay, Nova Scotia, on the 9th of November, 1867. The Amazon was acquired under shady circumstances by an American, Richard W. Haynes, who renamed her Mary Celeste, to avoid paying import taxes. Superstition amongst seamen is strong, and a renamed vessel is often considered bad luck. Haynes only held on to the ship for a short time, selling it for debt to James H. Winchester, another Nova Scotian. The vessel was to be used between U.S. ports and the West Indies, and was refitted in New York in 1872. An American, Benjamin S. Briggs, became part owner and captain of the Mary Celeste. The ship set sail for Genoa on the 7th of November, 1872, with the captain, his wife, and newborn child, as well as seven crew members and a cat on board. 
Mary Celeste passed the De Grata, another vessel that would be bound for Genoa, on the way out of the harbor, and the two captains exchanged nods. At 1 p.m. on the 4th of December, 1872, the Di Grata spied the Mary Celeste in obvious distress, and the crew of the Di Grata boarded the vessel. Captain Morehouse of the Di Grata noted the disorderly state of the sails, some of which were furled, some hanging loose, two in tatters. The lifeboats were missing, and nobody was spied on deck. The mystery deepened as the boarding party explored the ship. No one was found on board the ship, but all the crew's belongings were still present. The navigational charts were in disorder, and three and a half feet of water was found in the ship's bottom. But the cargo of 1,701 barrels of industrial alcohol was undisturbed. There was a six-month supply of food for the crew, but no one on board to eat it. The final mystery was the disassembly of one of the ship's two bilge pumps. The mystery of what happened to the crew of the Mary Celeste has prompted theories ranging from sea monsters, unlikely given the condition of the vessel, to pirates, the cargo was undisturbed, to some nefarious plan of the captain. A Smithsonian article, Abandoned Ship, the Mary Celeste, posits that navigational errors, a bilge pump damage by a former cargo of coal, heavy weather, and the captain's inability to determine how much water was in the hold, led to abandonment. While Smithsonian Magazine presents a fairly comprehensive review of the events, it fails to answer the key question in this mystery. No one has ever determined what happened to the captain, his family, and the seven crew members. Mary Celeste is not the only Canadian vessel to have crew disappear under mysterious circumstances. In another story, we encounter the tale of the Resolvson was of a size with the Mary Celeste, a 143-ton brigantine, which was located by the British warship Mallard on the 29th of August, 1883 about 50 miles east of Catalina, a community on the coast of Newfoundland. The Resolvin appeared to be adrift with no activity showing on deck. As with the Mary Celeste, the boarding party found the vessel to be slightly damaged, but still seaworthy. The lifeboat missing, and there was even a small fire alight in the gallery stove. Investigators found that the ship had been built in nearby Prince Edward Island, but was registered in Wales. The only theory those who investigated the case could come up with was that the captain, John James, was unfamiliar with icebergs and ordered the ship abandoned when a berg was spotted. This bizarre event happened within 50 miles of the coast of Newfoundland, yet not a trace of one of the 14 men was ever found. We can guess all we like, but as for answers, we can explain nothing. Again, the primary mystery here is what happened to the crew of this seaworthy vessel. A captain does not order the abandonment of a ship without good reason, and I doubt that the sighting an iceberg, even if one is familiar with the floating glacier pieces, would be enough to make this admittedly experienced captain leave his ship. It seems far more likely that a captain might err on the side of caution and give the ice a wide berth, but remain with his ship. Again, it almost seems as if the sea swallowed up the crew and left the ship behind. Many theories have been expounded for the disappearance of the crews of these vessels but none of them seem entirely satisfactory. In the case of both the Mary Celeste and the Resolvin, theorists surmised that the seamen abandoned ship close to land, but in neither case was anything further heard of the people on board these ships. While there might be a natural explanation for the disappearances, I don't believe we can rule out a paranormal explanation for the lost crew. 
people who disappear in fog or mist or are teleported to faraway locations, and these paranormal incursions are certainly things we should consider in the cases of Mary Celeste and Resolvent. There's also the darker side of the lore of merfolk, where these creatures can lure crew members off their ship with a song and lead them to their watery doom. In these cases, we must keep options natural and supernatural open. While abandoned ships are spooky enough, when looking at stories of the sea, we must also look at those strange vessels that some call phantom or ghost ships. The Phantom of Northumberland Strait, the Glengarry, Prince Edward Island. Couple were preparing for bed when they looked out the window, attracted by a bright glow on the horizon. It was a ship, but a ship engulfed in flames. They quickly called in an alarm and were asked for the particulars. Where was the ship? What did she look like? What direction was she heading? Once the couple had provided the required information, they were told that they had seen the Phantom of Northumberland Strait. For an hour, the couple sat and watched as the flaming ship continued north up the strait between Prince Edward Island and Nova Scotia. There is no set origin story for this phantom ship, but the burning vessel has been spotted throughout the history of the Maritimes. It was first seen in 1786 at the Sea Cow Head Lighthouse, Prince Edward Island, during one of the area's infamous nor'easterns. In that sighting, the lighthouse keeper was convinced that the vessel was going to flounder on the rocks until it turned into the storm and disappeared. Though there have been a number of sightings of the mysterious vessel, there appears to be no schedule for the phantom ship to appear. The only consistent thing about the sighting is that the phantom ship cannot be boarded. A rescue team from Charlottetown Harbor discovered this when they went to the aid of a three-master sailing ship that was burning out in the channel. The rescuers reported that they were certain the ship was doomed as it was fully engulfed in flames. They could see figures of the ship's crew as they ran frantically over the boat and her rigging trying to put out the fire. As the assisting boats approached, the seamen could feel the heat of the flames, but could find no survivors in the water. All they could see were the figures running about on deck. The rescuers wondered why these sailors did not save themselves. A mist arose and swallowed the ship, and when it dissipated, there was nothing on the surface of the water. In 1988, the crew of a ferry crossing Northumberland Strait reported seeing a ship in flames. The crew members, all men who had heard the story of the Phantom of Northumberland Strait, directed their radar towards the location of the sighting. None were surprised when the screen detected nothing on the water. The Phantom of Northumberland Strait is not the only ghostly vessel to haunt the waters off the Maritimes. A sighting in November 1910 of a Phantom schooner occurred in the Conception Bay off St. John's, Newfoundland. The witnesses were crew on watch for another vessel named the Victor. Those on watch sighted two lights ahead and then a third and eventually others so that the ship approaching was ablaze with light. The Victor closed the distance to the other vessel and the watch, along with the captain and others of the crew, saw people moving around the deck and noted that the main bloom appeared to be broken. There was no sound at all from the other vessel. No voices, no flapping of canvas, no creaking of rigging. As suddenly as it had appeared, the silent specter vanished before the eyes of the victor's crew. In 1711, the British longed to incorporate French Canada into their vast worldwide empire. These designs went far enough for the English to launch a naval sortie up the St. Lawrence toward the undefended city of Quebec. That sortie came to grief in a dense fog that caused the ship to lose their way, with some running aground on the shore. A related legend tells of the sorcerer Jean-Pierre Levelet of the Isle of Orleans conjuring the fog 
to confound the British fleet. Whether natural or magical, the commander of the force lost a fifth of his fleet and retreated in defeat. So, today at Cap de Spor, the discomfiture of the English is commemorated by a strange light passage, a storm, an olden day sailing craft crowded with red-coated soldiers appears and if your luck is in and your eyesight is good, you may see an officer-like figure on the bowsprit, one hand pointing at the shore, the other clasping a white-clad lady, but the light dims and a crash resounds, echoed by a fearful shriek, and the unlucky ship vanishes. It is not just the seas of the Maritimes that hosts phantom ships. There are records of the appearance of a phantom lake steamer on Lake Ontario. In August of 1910, the witness was none other than Rowley W. Murphy, a distinguished marine historian, and the combined crews of the yacht on this holiday sail. Murphy was a youth at the time, but the sighting was vouchsafed by the crew of all three yachts in the party. The three sailing yachts had decided to spend the night in a quiet shelter basin at the mouth of the creek, called Etobicoke, now a suburb of Toronto. As there was no reason to go ashore, all the sailors retired early, and by midnight were deep in happy dreams. Their slumber was interrupted by four blasts on a steamer's whistle. There, flooded by moonlight, was a steamer, heading about west-southwest at about half speed, and approximately half a mile offshore. The seamen on the yachts shook off sleep and responded to the distress signal, rowing out to try to render aid. No one could identify the vessel, but, as you might imagine, when the yachters arrived at the other ship, there was nothing there but clear open water. I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell, and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!